So I'm, I'm extremely sorry for this introduction. Um, so uh, unfortunately, I have a flight to catch. So I'll, I, I thank the organizers, chairpersons, for allowing me to finish my talk in this session, which is actually scheduled in the next one. Uh, I'm not going to, be, going to be talking more about the technique of MIS posterior cervical decompression. And we know that uh, uh, you know MIS posterior cervical decompression is always uh, fraught with certain difficulties, certain challenges, and there is always a certain doubt that you know it may not achieve the adequate amount of decompression that we really want uh, to achieve in a multi-level cervical compressive myelopathy. So what we did was we did a study to compare uh, prospectively. Uh, no, uh, it was non-randomized. Non, non uh, the benefits of a multi-level MIS decompression versus an open conventional approach, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So as we know, degenerative cervical myelopathy is a conglomerate of multiple pathological factors, and it's not just one single entity. And ultimately, whenever it is symptomatic, so it's almost always a surgical option. You have multiple surgical options with anterior, posterior, but by far the most commonly performed surgery for a multi-level, more than three-level degenerative cervical myelopathy is a posterior decompressive laminectomy, either with or without fusion, when, depending on the presence of, uh, uh, depending on uh, the cervical alignment as well as presence or absence of any instability and subluxation. Now, so the anatomy of uh, the posterior cervical musculature and the nuchal ligament is quite... Uh, you're not audible in terms of clarity. So I don't know whether the mic needs to be closer or you need to speak slower. We are not able to make out. You're loud enough, but we're not able to make out. Okay, okay. So now? Okay. Uh, so, uh, so basically, to understand the posterior cervical musculature anatomy as well as the anatomy of the nuchal ligament, you know, there are several studies which have shown the importance, just like in the lumbar spine, the importance of the midline ligamentous structures, that is the nuchal ligament, which has got two different components, the areolar and the lamellar portions, as well as, you know, the role it plays in restricting cervical spine flexion and the importance of posterior cervical musculature and the importance of preserving the muscular attachments to especially the C2 and the C7 spinous processes, which has results in significantly less post-operative axial pain, which has been shown in several studies. I'm not going to, to, into the details of these studies. And, and there have always, al always been attributed, the post-operative muscular atrophy or the paraspinal muscle injury uh, has been attributed uh, to the post-operative axial neck pain that develops uh, in, the, in, in patients with post-operative laminectomy to me or laminoplasty and several Japanese uh, papers have come out which have shown intramuscular roots uh, to, to have resulted in a lesser incidence of post-operative axial uh, neck pain. And, 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 you know, we went through the literature, there, were, there, are, there are quite a good number of papers which have shown the, the, uh, the application of posterior cervical uh, decompression techniques. But most of these levels, most, most of these papers are just limited to two or three levels. Uh, they have never done it for a multi-level uh, posterior cervical decompression. So, so what we did was we also started with simple cases where we required an anterior and a posterior approach. We did a posterior, uh, you know, this, this is one of the cases where we did an ACDF and required a posterior decompression as well because of the uh, unilateral uh, compression there. So we, we, this is a small surgical video which is showing that we have decompressed the ipsilateral level. So this is the ligamentum flavum that is being removed and the ipsilateral cord decompression is done. And just like what we do in the lumbar spine, we tilt the tube to the contralateral side and, and sublaminar, the contralateral sublaminar decompression, the, the inner cortex of the contralateral lamina can be drilled just like we do in a lumbar spine with a 1.7 millimeter burr and then we can remove the ligamentum flavum. We can free the ligamentum flavum from its attachment, and we can remove the ligamentum flavum using either a hook or a forceps, or sometimes we can even use a one millimeter upcut in order to remove the ligamentum from the contralateral side, and that will result in a, in a good, good enough decompression of the cervical spinal cord. And, but, but this was just a single level. So what do we do for multi-level? Like when, when we have to, usually these cervical decompressive myelopathies are multi-level pathologies. So we, we, we used the two incision techniques, the upper incision we use to decompress C3 and C4, and sometimes if required, we can do a sublaminar decompression at C2 as well. And the lower incision, we can use it for C5 and C6, and that can also be angulated downwards into to decompressing C7 if it was required. And we, and we did a post-operative MRI for most of these patients, and we found that the uh, result that we obtained were, were decent enough. With two incisions, we were able to decompress a good enough length of the cervical spine. Even in uh, slightly more stenotic cases or OPL cases also, we have used its technique. But, but I'm not here to show the case examples. Now, now there are several questions that we need to be that need to be answered. 
Is the decompression adequate? That is the most important question. And whatever decompression we are able to achieve with an MIS technique, does it result in a clinical improvement that is comparable to an open conventional laminectomy? And obviously the third and the most important question, after we do all these things, are there any advantages? So we did a pilot study, not many, 10 cases, uh, prospective, open and conventional, and we virtually assessed everything, clinical, uh, WAS, JOA, MDI, NURIC, and NDI, pre-operative, post-operative day one, seven, six weeks, and three months. We did laboratory parameters to assess any differences, CRP, ESR, TL, TLC, and CPK, which were done on pre-op, post-op day one, three, five, and seven. We assessed radiologically the cross-sectional area of the dural sac and the spinal cord independently, pre-operatively and post-operatively in the post-operative MRI and also post-operative T2 signal change, both in the deep group as well as the superficial group and the physical or the physiotherapist. Our, we involved a physiotherapist who assessed the extensor muscle strength and, the, and its improvement after post-operative physiotherapy uh, uh, between uh, comparable to a pre-operative level. So this is how we measured the pre-operative and post-operative cross-sectional area of the dural sac as well as the spinal cord and the uh, deep muscular group. So we considered this as the deep muscular group. Usually there is a significant amount of facial between the deeper and the superficial paraspinal muscle group in the cervical spine and this as the uh, uh, superficial group. And as you can see, this is a post-operative open case where the deep muscle group is significantly edematous whereas the superficial group is less so. So this is how we assess. So now the three questions that I mentioned, the first question is the efficacy of decompression adequate. Now as you can see, the cross-sectional area of the dural sac between the pre-operative and post-operative images, there is a significant improvement in the post-operative dural sac area in the open group because we are decompressing to a larger extent. But if you look at the cross-sectional area of the spinal cord that has improved, which is, which is actually the clinically relevant part or the Pavlova ratio or more accurately measured as the cross-sectional area of the spinal cord, there is a proportionate improvement in both the open as well as the minimally invasive group between pre-operative and post-operative, which means to say that the amount of cross the spinal cord decompression which really matters, not the dural sac decompression, is almost similar in both of these cases and we can con con conclude telling that adequate decompression can be done in MIS. So now does it result in a clinical improvement? Now uh, there is a bias here, so th th this was the being done for the first time, so we were not selecting very severely myelopathic neuric grades 4 and 5, mo most often in this case, in, uh, in uh, uh, MIS group, though later on we included a few patients in the initial stages, most of these were three, neuric grades three. And so that is why there is an obvious difference in the pre-operative levels itself between the uh, dis disability indexes uh, between the um, MIS and the open group. But if you see, there is a proportional improvement in all these indices between pre-operative and post-operative le levels, and there was no significant difference. Obviously, the duration of surgery was more, but the blood, blood loss was significantly less. And, and we, uh, as expected in any case, as expected in the lumbar spine as well, and as been shown in multiple studies in cervical spine also, we observed that the post-operative elevation in TLC, CRP, CPK, and ESR was significantly higher in the open group as compared to the MIS group. The post-operative muscle edema as expected was higher in the open group as compared to the MIS group. And we also did a, uh, you know, in MIS group, basically it's a unilateral technique and we are not going to the contralateral side, the opposite side, paraspinal muscles are, were, were completely unaffected. And this was a study which, uh, this was a statistical analysis that, that we did for the same. The neck extensor muscle strength was assisted was uh, estimated by a passive biofeedback device by a physiotherapist preoperatively, postoperatively at three months, and which showed significantly higher improvement, which was not statistically significant, but a, but a better improvement in the MIS group in the postoperative extensor muscle strength as compared to a uh, comparable open group. So this, these are the questions that we did. One is, is the efficacy of decompression adequate? We show that it is yes. Clinical benefit in our study, we, sh we, sh we saw that the patients improved, but considering the bias that whether we can apply the same technique in severely myelopathic, in grade four, grade five, neuric grade, uh, neurics, uh, whether, whether that also will result in a significant improvement in using MIS technique, that's something that is a gray area that we still need to find an answer for. And obviously, there are significant advantages for using an MIS technique for multi-level cervical decompression as compared to an open technique. Thank you so much.